Hello everyone. It's so great to have you all here today. Uh, I'm Rebecca. I'm an engineering student at Oxford and I'm also one of the co-founders of the IEA. And on behalf of the IEA, thank you all so much for joining us for the second session of our conference. We're so thrilled to have Mr. Baker speaking to us for our inaugural conference, and I'm sure we're all excited for the talk. Let me just take a moment to introduce him. Bill Baker is a structural engineering partner at Skidmore Owings and Merrill, where he has led the structural engineering practice for over 20 years. While widely regarded for his work on super tall buildings, notably the world's tallest building, the Burj Khalifa, Bill's expertise also extends to long span roof structures and specialty structures such as the Broadgate Exchange House in London and the Entrance Pavilion for General Motors headquarters in Detroit. He has also received numerous awards, including the gold medal from the ISTRUCT and the ASCE Outstanding Projects and Leaders Lifetime Award for Design. So today we'll be hearing from Mr. Baker on Is the Sky the Limit? But before I hand over the session to Mr. Baker, I just want to mention a couple of things about the question answer session that will be happening after the talk. You can send in your questions that you have for Mr. Baker during the talk or after the talk during the question answer session using the little Q&A icon on, your top, on the top right of your screen or the Q&A pane on the right of your screen. Also, feel free to mention your name and your university or where you're from, along with the question to introduce yourself. But if you wish to remain anonymous, that's completely fine too. So that's all for me. Over to you, Mr. Baker. Well, thank you, Rebecca, and thank you for inviting me uh, to to speak today and at your at your conference. And it's a very interesting um, uh, um, conference title that we have here, which is Engineering the Next Decade. And and the title of my talk is uh, Is the Sky the Limit? Uh, but what I but looking at your the title that you guys suggested for for the uh, for the conference, maybe do a little a reflection on, on how it is, particularly given that uh, a lot of the people here on the call are are students, and um, and what's going to come up here in the next next decade. Um, and so uh, let's talk about some some current issues uh, that are going to be very important in in the very very near future. Uh, first of all, let's talk about population issues. OK, there's a huge increase in population, as everyone knows. In the next, next 10 years, there'll probably be uh, not quite a, uh, another billion people, but almost another billion people. And it's been quite remarkable. During uh, my lifetime, there are now three times as many people alive than there were when I was born. Uh, which is uh, <laughs> you know, enough to give one pause, so if nothing else. And and given that uh, we have a bunch of engineers uh, on the line, uh, let's look at the first derivative of that plot, okay? Which is the rate of growth. And so, um, uh, so the um, the world in which your predecessors live, such as myself, and what we had our practice, were were um, many many years of very very high. Uh, population growth and that's and we're still continuing on that but it's going to be at a decreasing rate o over the time of your um, careers it's going to be a different uh, a different animal uh, and and it'll be interesting that how you and your your careers as you develop will adjust to that but uh, but even though the rate is decreasing the abs absolute increase in, in the number of people is quite large and and, and the increases are going to be primarily in asia and africa though it's predicted that that the, the asian growth will level off after in the not too distant future um, the and so as as this population growth, all these people, uh, uh, more and more people in the world, and, and furthermore, they're all moving to the cities. And so there's going to be a, a tremendous amount of construction that is needed uh, to um, to accommodate these people in a quality in a, in a lifestyle that it has that that is that is acceptable. Uh, it's, it's going to take um, you know a, a lot of a lot of construction to do that, but uh, but in that uh, in that context, we also have the climate issues, and this is the critical decade. Um, you know, if you look at the you know the the studies that have been done, that uh, um, you know the 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 increase in in world temperature uh, is is going up going up very rapidly. We're very concerned about this. 
And uh, if we do corrections now, uh, with this window of opportunity between now and um, 10 years from now, uh, we have a chance at least of mitigating some of these issues. So it, I, I, I think it's important that uh, that this be part of the uh, the next decade that you, um, uh, as you go into practice or go on to the next stage of your career, that you, you're very conscious of this. And um, in the world that uh, I work in, which is um, architecture and engineering, um, you know, uh, there's a lot that we can do. A huge amount of the uh, the uh, carbon that's generated is, e is either operational carbon for buildings or uh, embodied carbon for structures and buildings. And, and it's the embodied carbon that you spend now. And so you might argue that that's probably even more important than operational carbon, but also operational carbon is getting much better. We're getting much uh, many more renewable resources in order to accommodate um, uh, operational issues. And then uh, you, 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 know, you pour in that uh, what's happened in, in architecture, which is not so we say helpful. Uh, let, let's get, look back, you know, you know, uh, with the advent of very, very powerful computers, um, we are now able to engineer things that should not be engineered in the past. And um, and this could uh, this is not always good. Okay, if you, as you go around the cities, uh, you see these buildings are all saying, uh, trying to stand out on the skyline. They're shouting, "Look at me!" Uh, Here is a shot from Shanghai from a few years ago with the uh, uh, various buildings with various tops trying to trying to stand out in the crowd, and and all these remind me of the movie Brazil, which is a good movie. I I suggest you you, you try to uh, take a look at it. Uh, it has a very architectural uh, theme to it in an abstract way. And one of the characters in the movie is this woman, Ida Lowry. And I always think about when I think about this, some of these buildings that, that's been happening, say, uh, in the early part of this century, I think of her hat, this upside down shoe, and 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 it's it's. It's about trying to trying to stand out in architecture. If you saw this woman walking down the street, you would certainly notice her, but then maybe not. Okay, uh, it, it's like all these buildings are saying, "Look at me," and and uh, and it's like when you have a dinner in a very crowded, noisy restaurant where everyone's shouting and you can hear no one. And so the challenge is to create uh, ideas and technology that will lead to new. Why new? Because uh, you know, uh, people, society wants to be moving forward. It can't just be the retro. Substantive, where we have architecture. What I mean by substantive, where we have uh, new architecture that perhaps is different because it's actually better. And then finally, sustainable architecture, and because we have to do sustainable architecture uh, and buildings um, because we cannot. Uh, it's an existential issue if we do not. And so, um, so uh, where are we? Well, uh, uh, we engineers design in a world of limited natural resources, but we're a world that has to grow. As I said, there's going to be almost a, another billion people in, in the next decade. Uh, we have limited financial resources, but we need to expand prosperity. It has to be there for everyone. And so, uh, and we also, as we saw some of those uh, buildings I showed you just a minute ago, kind of a world of somewhat irresponsible excess, but we're also in a world that needs dreams and inspirations. So uh, as you go into your career, ask yourself, uh, engineers, are you gonna, uh, to, to what extent are you the facilitators of dreams? Or are we also sometimes, if we're not careful, the enablers of willful excess? And this is a very, very important uh, topic. I, and for instance, so if I let me, um, so what do I mean by facilitators of dreams? Okay, <laughs> here's the Eiffel Tower. One could say perhaps it's a very expensive way to make a restaurant. However, I can't imagine Paris without it, or France without it, or, or Europe without it, or the world without the Eiffel Tower. So I think it. You know, we do need dreams and aspirations. So I think, I think that uh, you know, but this has to be done wi wisely. Uh, you know, the um, Paris does not need uh, two, more than one Eiffel Tower, if you will. Um, you, now you can imagine an, an icon of willful access. So I uh, think about uh, what you've seen around the world, and uh, and 
and what you might put into this category and then fill in the blank image here because I think we each have our own um, so we say um, a building that uh, we think is like a little bit over the top perhaps should not have been done um, and uh, and the one I and the one that I may think of maybe the one that you love the most so I I, I chickened out a little bit here and, and didn't um, didn't give you uh, some of my choices for this for this uh, uh, category. So uh, what is the responsibility of, of, of engineers? What do we need to do? Well, we have to have a position. You know, you need to sit and think about, you know, what is your values? Uh, just following orders is not an answer. So, you know, I, I designed this uh, very wasteful structure because I was told to. Um, you know, and uh, just because we can does not mean we should. Now, this is a very kind of uh, somewhat of a recent uh, uh, phenomena brought in by the computer. It used to be that buildings were reasonably efficient because that's all the engineer could calculate because of very limited computational uh, tools. And nowadays, we have extremely powerful graphic software, the architects or the the, uh, the designers or the owners could ask for something that's quite wild and we can make it not fall over, which is not a good place to be. It should be something that we should design things which are natural, that are naturally efficient, that um, that have um, um, uh, that where the architect and engineer are, engineering are together in, in one thing so that they that they work together elegantly and efficiently. And so there needs to be a critical discussion. And so uh, each of you as engineers should think about, you know, what is your position on this? And, and in part of that, I, I think you need to develop a personal philosophy and, uh, that relates in design values. Now, the personal philosophy may not be related to engineering per se. It could be related to the ethical standards to which you've been raised. And then the question is, how does it affect your design values or, or what you're going to do as an as an engineer? And um, and I started thinking about this because I was working on this project with this artist. His name is James Terrell, and he happens to own that uh, that uh, hill behind him, that which is a uh, extinct volcano called Rodin Crater. And he is an artist who's made a series of of, of major interventions in, into the into the volcano for experiencing of light and color and the like. And um, and um, I was uh, and my team were are collaborating with James on this uh, expansion of the what's going on there in this uh, this kind of bump on the side of the volcano it's called a fumarole, where uh, the plan was to um, the plan is to uh, create this lunar observatory, which will uh, where you where you will see uh, moon rises and moon sets for the next uh, few millennia, and, um, and you can see stars from above. And basically, inside the building, inside the side of the mountain, is this giant. It's called an eyeball. It's a 40 foot diameter or 12 meter diameter sphere, which uh, has lenses in it that it captures light from the uh, Moon rises and moon sets that that project on the back uh, side of, of the sphere, and then um, from above it also captures starlight that that, that is then projected against the, the bottom of the sphere. And and um, when I uh, got involved and in, in in my team got involved in, in this project, it was a little bit of a train wreck. There's like all these kind of ideas where they're crashing into each other, and so one of the things that we did is we we set this kind of hierarchical things like the, the sphere was alpha it was number one it got the right away if there are any conflicts whatever it had the conflict with got out got out of its way and then the beta was was the cylinder and then um you know the uh, the gamma you know the third was the dome and then everything else was 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 uh, of lower value or, or lower even though it might be essential uh was but was would get out of the way of these others and whenever the, there was a conflict and he and i were making a presentation to a potential donor and i described what I, what uh, what we had uh, my firm skimmer and samaro have been doing uh as um as creating messian simplicity and then uh and then james corrected me and he said no no quaker simplicity now I had absolutely no idea. Uh, uh, you know, Quaker's a religion uh, that I knew absolutely nothing about, and so I actually started going to some Quaker meetings just to understand. And 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 um, 
and uh, if I could summarize as someone from the outside, the, the values that they taught or that they believe in our simplicity and speech, besides being pacifist, uh, uh, the um, uh, uh, simplicity in speech, dress, food. And James's mother always told him to step into the light. And imagine that you were he and uh, you decided to become an artist. Maybe you're not even religious anymore, but you've been raised to these values of simplicity and light, and you became an artist. You might create something like this. What you're seeing actually doesn't even exist. This, this floating pyramid of light is created by your eye. It doesn't actually exist. What you're looking at, you're looking at the corner of a room and, and the light is behind the, the, the covering of the wall and, and reflecting on into the corner and your eye is forming th this, floating, this floating pyramid. So talking about simplicity and light. And it made me start to evaluate what is the things that I value? And this is what I urge you, everyone on the call to do, is think about uh, what have you been raised to value and how does that affect what you're going to do as a, as a designer or a researcher or whatever your field is going to be? So for me, I, I came up with a proposed set of values. What do I value? Well, I, I value efficiency, okay? I think, I think most engineers do. Uh, simplicity. I really like simplicity a lot. Now, simplicity is not a good, bad, uh, good versus bad, uh, because you know complexity can is just fine. Also, it's just I prefer simplicity. Uh, I like minimalism, uh, like this, uh, this, uh, this house by Mies van der Rohe. You know, which is you know where it's stripped down to, 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 uh, to its to its essence. Uh, I like uh, economy, this is this building I worked on in London many years ago, which is very, very efficient uh, because it's using very, very efficient systems. Uh, elegance, uh, you know, if those on the call can someday design something as elegant as this irrigation device for, uh, that you see on the prairies uh, of, of mid-America, uh, totally functional, but, but very elegant at the same time. Uh, utility, uh, what we need to do needs to be useful, um, but it should, do, it should be useful, but also harmonious. I think har harmony is very, very important part, part of this. Uh, order and hierarchy. Now this is a little bit, um, I'm not talking about um, social order and hierarchy, but, but aesthetic and technical order and hierarchy. Everything you see in this photograph, so this is the base of that building in London, the arch building I showed you a few slides earlier. Um, everything in this photograph is essential, but not equally important. So what are the dominant ideas that are part of this? And in this case, uh, we determine that to be the arch, which is the diagonal coming in from above, the tie, which is the horizontal going to the side, and then the buttress, the support below. And those are the hierarchy and everything else is, is, is shall we say, held back aesthetically where it's, it's quieter. Uh, uh, and, um, and also sometimes you'll have technical hierarchy, which, uh, which will uh, tell you who goes, gets, gets the right away and the stuff. So that, that column that you see that's, that's also sitting on that abutment is held back and held quiet behind the, the arch and the tie. And this is very important. This is actually a very important part of uh, engineers working with uh, other disciplines such as architects is how do you tell the story of the building through the structure? Okay, I believe in clarity. Can you see your, see your load pass as you go down? Uh, proportions, you know, things should be well proportioned and, and, and reasonable proportions. Uh, th this was a, a fun little uh, house that I, I worked on three years ago where I was uh, figuring out how big the uh, mullions needed to be to carry the windlass. This is an island. Uh, this is called, this is a house on Fisher's Island, which is um, between uh, Connecticut and uh, New York, uh, Long Island uh, in the United States. And they have, uh, they do get hurricanes. So I was sizing the mullions to take hold up the glass. And I realized, well, you know, it was strong enough to hold up the roof. So we, uh, so what we did is we got rid of the mullions and we just used the columns and we connect the glass directly to the structure and, and made it much more elegant. 
appropriateness. Okay, uh, finding a picture of appropriate is not as clear as finding a picture like this, which is inappropriate. Uh, I hate it when I see um, structure used inappropriately as um, decoration. Uh, you know, this homeowner apparently wanted some columns, and it's it's just this ridiculous application of structure where it doesn't uh, doesn't apply. And I and I for the life of me cannot figure out how the garage works. Um, then rational designs where, where, where it's clear. I think uh, this is the John Hancock building in Chicago. It's it's uh, it's the icon of Chicago. Uh, it is, um, you know, it's, it's so rational and clear in how it how it works. I also urge uh, young uh, engineers and, and others to don't be afraid to reexamine uh, past systems and solutions. A lot of times people feel like they have to do something that's never been done before. For instance, let's say the design problem was the chair. You could say, well, here we are, we're done. We do not need to work on that anymore. Well, guess what? Corbu had a different idea. Same function, uh, which is very simple. A place to sit down, a place to lean your back uh, against and hold you up off the floor, but completely, completely different designs. And then there were others and then others. And so you have this incredibly richness that's possible from a very limited problem. So it's, it's, it's don't be afraid to go back to an, an earlier, you'll say, solution and, and own it and make it your own. And uh, another thing I find very, very helpful uh, is to describe your design or your idea or your concept or your research or whatever it is in words. And if it takes a lot of words to describe the essence of your idea, you're not there yet, okay? Uh, you know, you need to clarify and simplify and edit it down. You know, if you get down to, uh, you know, a paragraph or a few sentences, maybe you're close enough, maybe you're there. But sometimes, sometimes you can get it down to uh, something that, that, that's that, that's very short. And, and this is true in, um, in uh, for all disciplines, you know, um, for instance, here's this quote from Mark Twain about writing a letter. You know, I didn't have time to write a short letter, so I wrote a long one instead. I, I think every culture has a, has a quote somewhat, somewhat like this. Or in a speech, uh, um, uh, the, uh, the Prime Minister Winston Churchill said, I'm going to make a long speech because I have not had the time to prepare a short one. Because it, it takes a lot of work to make something simple. And sometimes you can get it down to where it really is to the essence, where it's very few words, it's very clear, but it's not easy to get there. And sometimes you can get down to a noun plus an adjective. For, for example, a braced tube. Or uh, a bundled tube. This is the Sears Tower, now called the Willis Tower in Chicago. Or the Burj Khalifa in Dubai. We called it a buttressed core. And so if you if you can get your ideas that clear, you can explain it to yourself, you can explain it to your teammates, you can explain it to the other disciplines, to the contractors, to the owners, and it helps you resolve conflicts. Because you know what these these structures, these these uh, these buildings, these uh, whatever it is you're working on, is likely to be very complex, and you need to be able to to figure out the essence and helps you re resolve conflicts. I certainly owe, uh, urge you to own your technology, to really know it, uh, whatever your, your, your field of engineering is. Uh, currently for the next, say, decade or decade and a half, maybe two decades, we're going to be in the computational age where you really need to know how to how to manipulate the box and, 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 and do these things. But at a certain point, we're going to be in the not too distant future, we're going to be in the post computational age. And your value as an engineer is by understanding basic theory and behavior. You know, I am a designer. I design buildings all over the world. One of the most useful tools I have for design is theory. Because if you're going to do something new and unique, you're not going to look it up in a book. You're going to create it, but you can create it out of basic physics theory and behavior. And so uh, in a few decades, what is your value as an engineer going to be? It's going to be interpretation of what this 
uh, you know, this artificial intelligence algorithm is going to determine, but you're going to be able to interpret what it is and explain it to your colleagues because you're going to understand the theory, the fundamentals of theory and behavior. It's also important to build on existing ideas. Um, of course, you know, there's the very famous quote by Sir Isaac Newton. If I have seen further, it's only by standing on the shoulders of giants. It's a, it's a good quote, but the one I really like is the one by Picasso. Bad artists copy, great artists steal. Now, my interpretation of that is you don't just do what someone else has done, but you understand the ideas behind what someone else has done. And then you make them those ideas your own and you, you create something new. And, and most engineers, and unfortunately, particularly instructional engineers, do not know their history, the history of their disciplines. And so here's a list of, of structural engineers and designers and artists and architects that uh, structural engineers should know. You, you should know um, that's like a, that you know that that building's like a Sukhoff, or or that reminds me of a York Schleich uh, building, or or a Heinz Eisler or Felix Candela, uh, and so you know you need to know what these others have done because uh, if you know what they've done, perhaps you get the idea behind what they've done and you can create something new, and you can borrow eyes, you can synthesize ideas. Well, I'm going to take this idea. From from Felix Candel, I'm going to merge it with this idea that I that I interpret uh, from from uh, Vladimir Sukhov, and I'm going to make something that neither of them had ever done. So, uh, in this next decade, as we go forward, what should we do? And and in my opinion, my suggestion is research, particularly for those engineers on the calls who are going to be in practice because you can create new architecture or whatever your field is. It doesn't have to, for the engineers who are not in, in my field, whatever it is your field is, you can create new things, particularly if you're a practitioner. Because what I have found uh, through my career is that blue sky research by designers, by people who are actually doing the work, can take us to new places. Uh, because uh, if you're actually working on projects and you're doing research, say, on the side, uh, you can create something new and then you will see applications that would, you would never imagined when you started. And uh, here on the slide, I'm showing some research we're doing on what's called graphic statics. And then we end up applying it to artwork uh, by this artist we worked with, uh, whose, whose name is uh, Janet Eckelman. And, and for the, uh, in the tall building research, I always go back to, uh, to the, these two uh, gentlemen, particularly one on the left, uh, an, an engineer architect named uh, Myron Goldsmith and his professor, Mies van der Rohe. And uh, as part of his thesis, uh, this is uh, um, almost uh, almost 70 years ago, he did this, the, these studies in, in the uh, technology of tall buildings, and it was all about efficiency. How could you do it for less? And then later in his career, he continued to, to teach and, and work, and uh, working with his colleague, Foster, Khan, the very famous uh, structural engineer, uh, and here's Myron Older, where uh, he actually, I, I said he was an engineer architect towards the end of his career, he functioned mostly as an architect, but collaborating with the structural engineer, Foster Khan, they did a tremendous amount of research where they come up with these ideas for tall buildings, uh, uh, the, uh, primarily through research at the Illinois Institute of Technology, uh, and, um, and came up with these ideas of how these buildings work, which re resulted in, in tall buildings uh, in reality, such as such as the John Hancock, where, where they figure out the rule of the Hancock, which is every time a vertical crosses a diagonal, it has to happen at a floor. Because of that geometric uh, relationship, you're able to uh, you're able to move loads all over. Uh, symmetrical loads, you're able to move to wherever you wish it to be. And so the, the action is to seek out new ideas and knowledge uh, through research, but engineers cannot do it by themselves. You need to work with uh, academics, architects, uh, other disciplines, um, you know, scientists, uh, both physical and, uh, and social scientists. You may think you have the greatest idea in the world, but if you can't sell it, or you can't convince others, it's going gonna, it's gonna to sit on the shelf. Uh, we need to reach outside of engineering to math mathematicians and programmers and many, many others. And there has to be a dialogue between disciplines. Uh, th this is a very, very famous picture of uh, engineers and architects uh, who worked on the uh, on the um, 
uh, Munich Olympics, uh, you know, with uh, Fry Otto and Jörg Schleich and and uh, Fritz Leonhardt and Heinz Eastler and Fred Auer and and Gabriel um, uh, here together, you know, collaborating because none of them could do them do this by themselves. And uh, it may sound a little odd, but engage an artist. I have found through the, uh, working with artists, with people who think la uh, very differently than you, uh, can be can be uh, quite interesting. Can inspire your own work in ways you you may not have expected. Uh, this is the studio for that uh, that art piece I showed you earlier, the Janet Eckelman studio, where she has all this experimentation going on with nets and the like. Which I find, you know, just very fascinating and inspires me in the work that I do. Um, and there is no one right answer. I, in engineering, so often, you know, uh, um, you know, you, you you get the right answer. There is no the right answer in the real world. Um, and and sometimes the most quote optimal answer is not the, really the one you want, because there may be other things that are important which we're not able to quantify as part of the algorithm and so you know perhaps the best solution is not quite the on the top of the hill but maybe a little bit on the side of the hill as you explore you know the design solutions uh, in our research we've really focused in deeply on geometry i think it's very very important and in part of this research is it's to provide why something works in addition to what works now, if you run some kind of computer program or whatever and you get a solution and you do not understand why it is the solution, you're going to be missing great opportunities. And so we, we work created, we try to come up with tools which can give us the what, some solutions, but we have to understand the why. And, and also geometry is the intersection of, of uh, architecture and structure. It's, it's, it's where it's the common language where the, the two disciplines meet. And geometry is the key to sustainability. Here I have two trusses, truss A and truss B, that are three to one cantilevers. They're doing exactly the same job, but for the same deflection, the one on top needs 60% more material. Not 6%, 60% more material. If you want to have a serious impact in sustainability, you need to understand how to how to use geometry in design, and sometimes these geometries will look a little odd to you. You, you know, they'll lead to new aesthetics. The, this uh, structure on the top may be a little visually uncomfortable to you initially, but it's much more efficient than the one on the bottom, as I'll explain here in a minute. And so, in our research leading to design. Uh, we had to come up with some terms that we were all speaking you know, with the common language. So we talked about the design domain and within the design domain, we have uh, three geometric aspects we looked at. One is called topology, which we define as what is connected to what. Shape, which is how do you take that topology and then shape it? And then finally, how do you uh, size the elements of that uh, uh, of that uh, structure? And and the, the sizing of the joints and, and, the, uh, and the connections is absolutely essential, but it is not where you're going to make the, the big savings. The, the big savings are going to happen in topology and shape. And so you, which is often called architecture, uh, so you as an engineer need to be heavily involved in that aspect uh, uh, of the design if you're truly going to get sustainable architecture. Uh, now, uh, uh, there's a lot of tools out there that we didn't have a few years ago, which are actually quite a bit of fun. They, they give you ideas, the th things that you, you might you might use as inspirations. You, we never take these as solutions, but we take these as idea generators. Like on the upper left, you, has, uh, it was, you might say is where to put the materials and by changing the settings on the program, you could end up if, like at the lower right, which is you might say is is to where to put or where to put the holes. Uh, you, you can take a problem that you're not familiar with and you might get some ideas. Now, I wouldn't build exactly what's coming out of this, but it may give me some ideas. As I see this Mitchell wheel appearing and this Mitchell, tr this kind of canted Mitchell truss that goes up up towards, towards the center. Um, you, you know, just by playing with boundary conditions, you can get some very, very interesting uh, structures, such as the one on the upper left, the arch, the tight arch in the upper left, where the hangers are not vertical. 
or the one on the lower right where the where the, the hangers are, 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 are organically down. Another tool we like to use a lot is ground structures where you have a bunch of nodes randomly um, uh, spaced out where you connect the nodes to their neighbors and then you connect them to the neighbors of the neighboring nodes and then to the neighbors of the neighbors of the neighbors to the neighbors of the neighbors. And eventually um, uh, you've got this incredible mesh and then you uh, then you do your, your 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 analysis and you get rid of the members that aren't doing you any good and you end up with a Mitchell truss, the very, very interesting organic shape, which is not very familiar to most of us. Uh, uh, but, you know, other tools like the topology, uh, the topology optimization give you uh, the, a similar answer, but not the same. And so um, from these various tools, you, you can study them and look at it and come up with, you know, how many how much information should I take from one tool versus versus the other as you come up with the ideas of, 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 for, for your design? And so uh, what we do is well, a lot of times we'll use multiple tools. So here's a ground structure and here's here's uh, a, a program called Polytop. It's a SIMP um, uh, methodology, S-I-M-P methodology. So so you look at the two of these and you and you look at it and you try to come up with an idea. And maybe you come up with an idea like this. And guess what? If you compare this to, like, say, the conventional solution, the one on the bottom, once again, you're you're saving a huge amount of material. For for equal deflection, um, you know, uh, so the one at the top, which is basically unbuildable because it's just too many members, but the the the, the one in the middle here is only five percent more material. It's amazingly efficient, whereas the conventional Pratt truss is 68% more material. So, you know, this is, you know, uh, you know, uh, from the sustainability point of view, what we have to do in the next few years, this is this is hugely important that we use highly optimized uh, geometries. Uh, you know, and so as you look at the, at the, the system advances, uh, you know, you know. Here, here's this uh, menu of structural systems, depending on, on the size of the problem, uh, which we, you can add to a, as we develop new systems. In fact, I, I think of these as not as systems, but species of animals. As you change scale uh, from one size problem to the next, a lot of times we need to invent new species of, of structure, which will lead to new architecture. And and so as we use these tools, this is using the Altair tool. Um, this is commercial optimization software. Uh, we come up with these shapes that that uh, we're able to interpret and, and create architecture, which is more efficient. Here we have this is in North Sydney, Australia, uh, uh, called uh, uh, 100 Mount Street, which is a uh, a concrete building which is braced with steel diagonals. And and not only did we use the optimization for the bracing, but we also use uh, you, know, you know, geometric stiffness ideas so that you realize that that set point in the middle doesn't really need to be braced uh, because you have equal tension, which is stabilizing and compression, which is destabilizing coming together. So it's neutrally stable. It just needs to be braced against, uh, um, you know, um, um, wind loads that are, and other direct impact loads. And so uh, taking these mental trust ideas, uh, in, and, and looking for ways of how do you carry the loads uh, gently? How do you turn the forces gently? Which is all, which is, which is what this is a, these geometries are about is, is nature likes to turn loads gently. And here, here's a proposed tower for Ch uh, China that, which is based on those ideas. Uh, of course, materials are, are, are right up there with geometry as important, particularly in sustainability. We've been doing a lot of research, as has been uh, many others uh, in, in timber. And, and, and in our research, we've been kind of, uh, we know that uh, for like a, a lot of buildings, we're competing against uh, reinforced concrete. And so uh, we've been looking at using a, a composite uh, so we can get longer spans. So we do a timber composite with concrete uh, as a as a methodology to uh, to address uh, some of the um, some of the technical issues of trying to to uh, to be efficient uh, in our constructions. And so we're looking at uh, timber concrete composite or even steel uh, timber composite uh, structure because, um, in fact, we just finished some research paid for by the American Institute of Steel Construction on timber floors because most of the steel or steel building there is there to hold up the concrete floors. And so by by making lightweight floors, uh, um, you can you can save in all the systems. And I'll talk a bit about more of that in a minute here. 
I, and so, you know, can you have leave behind formwork and then um, timber, uh, you know, negative carbon material so for your uh, for your cladding. So let's talk about um, the ubiquitous uh, concrete high rise tower. And, and uh, you know, concrete can be made uh, almost uh, cement can be made almost anywhere in the world. And so it, it's it's the uh, this it's the dominant thing. It's also uh, one of the major issues in that we have in in the climate climate crisis is the carbon created by by this new construction for these people who are moving to the cities and the population growth that we have to accommodate. So how can we do this smarter and better? And, and what's quite remarkable is that between 40 and 60% of the concrete in a concrete building is in the floors. And, um, and so most of the, of the columns and walls there is there to hold up the concrete. And so, uh, you know, how can we put uh, these floors on a diet so they're not as heavy and they don't use as much uh, 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 concrete. So, you know, this is a vact active area of research, a very important area of research. Um, and um, and what's interesting is, uh, is the eco ec economics of this. Unfortunately, um, it costs a lot of money in labor to build uh, a concrete structure. And so they will they would rather spend uh, contractors would rather, rather spend more concrete than less labor. Here is the a breakdown on the cost of doing a concrete slab. Most of it is the formwork labor and materials. The mat formwork materials is very small. Formwork labor, uh, re placing the reinforcement labor, and placing the concrete labor. The materials themselves are not the cost. Here's the concrete material cost, about 22%. Here's the uh, here's the cost of the rebar, about 9%. And the cost of the formwork around uh, uh, 6%. So how can we, as designers and engineers, be clever about can we can we come up with uh, systems that use less concrete but no more labor, or even less labor if possible in, in construction? Uh, here's some research we've been doing on, on different floor systems for concrete buildings, uh, working with a, 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 um, a uh, robotics uh, a group out of, out of Denmark called uh, Otico. Uh, we cut some uh, custom formworks which fits inside a standard 2.4 meter or 8 foot wide plywood uh, uh, formwork system which all the contractors have. So for no more labor we can have this fairly interesting a structure which which has uh, has about 20% less material than a conventional structure of with even shorter spans. It has the the uh, the dips allow for coordination with mechanical systems and the like, and and so you can end up with a new architecture, which which is uh, more efficient and loose. But we uh, but this is just uh, a start. We need to do even better, <laughs> and uh, we did this for an exhibition. And we, you can see, we even, even use the formwork as a bench over in the back there. Um, the um, other technical advances are coming along. Uh, you know, glass is, is a, of course a big deal in tall buildings. Uh, initially, in the 1950s, uh, you know, glass was a technical opportunity. Uh, in the 80s, they became a, an economic liability, so there's more opacity, and now it's a, they're an environmental li liability. So we, we try to have more and more opaque uh, uh, surfaces and, and less glass in the building. But perhaps in the near future, and I think this is going to be coming, hopefully for some of the researchers on this on this call, uh, where we can actually um, have glass, have great views, but also generate energy at the same time. The material changes are, are remarkable. Besides, you know, timber, uh, you know, uh, steel is getting amazingly strong. But as people, uh, perhaps there's metallurgists on the call here who 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 uh, develop, uh, uh, you know, very stronger and stronger uh, steels. Um, the concrete, I, we shouldn't even call it concrete anymore. It's it's amazing what's happened in the last few years. Uh, 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 concrete is is, you know, is unfortunately creating a great deal of carbon. And so uh, we need to do uh, a lot of research in, in how to use less of it or different mixes of it. Uh, you know, how can you make it stiffer? Here, here I just picked out one thing, which is some, some research happening in Northwestern University uh, on making uh, making concrete much stiffer. But also, you know, there, there's uh, using uh, recycled uh, glass uh, from um, from bottles to create make a 
basically, you know, I use you know a glass powder for, as a as a cement substitution. Uh, you know, and the more substitutions we do, the lower and lower we can get the carbon penalty of concrete, the better off we all will, will be. Uh, here, here's showing how just using uh, uh, carbon nan nanotubes, one can greatly increase the, the stiffness of concrete. Uh, you know, there's researchers such as, uh, here we have Professor uh, uh, Philippe Block from ETH Zurich showing uh, on some of the floor systems he's been researching uh, and, you know, and Philippe Block, even though he's in Switzerland, uh, he was originally from Belgium, so uh, he likes to say he wants to create a floor system where you need nothing, uh, the material doesn't need to be any stronger than Belgium chocolate. And so uh, here's a proposal. Or some of the work that's being done in TU Berlin by Mike Schleich on, on, on very, very lightweight, ultra lightweight uh, concrete, which has insulating values. So perhaps we can expose our structure and, and insulate our buildings at the same time. Um, you know, some of the other technology out there, of course, there's a great deal of research going on in 3D printing and both uh, uh, concrete uh, formwork, uh, which is an interesting application, and 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 uh, and then steel. Uh, machine learning. You know, this is going to be this is going to this is a real this is going to be a big game changer. Uh, we've been doing our research and how to using uh, machine learning for. Uh, uh, seismic evaluation. This is uh, uh, after the last Mexican, Mexico City earthquake. We went down there and did, uh, did some photographs, and we uh, trained the computer to be able to evaluate the damage to buildings. Uh, we've also been doing research on how to use the computer to uh, do rebar inspection, uh, and also uh, just uh, machine learning for the shapes of buildings and the like. Uh, new, new design processes. You know, uh, tall buildings and big buildings are very, very complex. And we've been working with uh, some software from uh, out of um, MIT, uh, which helps us to take uh, the, all these different criteria that we generally optimize by brain power uh, to, um, to 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 help us lead us to the to the most um, optimal shapes. Uh, you know, um, most of the a lot of the population growth is happening in high seismic areas. I think there's a great deal of research uh, opportunities in developing systems which are stiff for wind but soft for earthquakes. Um, <laughs> the transportation is going to change everything. We're going to, which is much for the better. Uh, you know, we're going to um, uh, maybe do deliveries through uh, through uh, um, uh, through drones and the like. Um, you know the. Uh, uh, we're going to need a lot for your parking garages and, and, and levels. It's going to be really, really quite remarkable. I think uh, the personal personal ownership of cars is going to kind of go away. But will this, uh, will we will we will we go from uh, the conventional urban mass transit we have today to autonomous ride sharing? Uh, it could be good, but we also have to be very careful because we need to, one of the most important sustainable things is is how we we use the land. Uh, if you took the Burj Khalifa. And you put it in Chicago, it would take that that red uh, rectangle you see on the right side of the screen here. Uh, that's how much room it did. If you did it in the normal, um, unfortunate American way of uh, of um, just single family housing, it would take that large blue rectangle on the left to have the same amount of of housing as you have in the in the the red block on the right. And so there needs to be a, a study of you know how can we. Uh, uh, you know what is the balance? Perhaps it's more the Parisian model, where you, you have, you know, it's not single-family housing, and it's not the not the high-rise so much, uh, but, but more 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 the mid-rise uh, towers. But having said that, you know, high-rises are definitely you know, part of the the, uh, the game plan for the next uh, several years. So we need to get much much more efficient in what we do. And and as you as you correct your ideas, you're going to find that guess what? It's not easy. As you come up with your ideas and you try to get them realized, it, you know it's not easy, but be you have to per, uh, persevere and 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 not give up. You know, first you have to create the idea, then you have to create the tools that you can use to apply the uh, the the idea and design, and then you have to find uh, uh, collaborators who are willing to invest time and effort to use it, and then you have to find the right project to use it on, and then you have to build the project, and so. Um, you, you can't give up. You have to have to keep pushing, and 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 we need more research. And I'm not talking about two or three people sitting around talking a couple times a week about ideas. 
can, I believe can change the world. I really believe that. Uh, you know, it, it is. It is. You know, you don't have a have to have a mass infrastructure. It's just, a, you know, uh, engineers thinking and talking to other engineers and designers and other disciplines that, that can can get you. But having said that, um, more funding would be helpful and, and certainly more participation because we must do efficient structures. We must do low carbon structures. But we also need to still have dreams and aspirations. You know, we have to come with a world where, 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 where we can achieve all these things, so that uh, so that uh, you know, um, you know, you know, the, 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 uh, shall we say the sky is not the limit. So with that, I'd like to say thank you and turn it back to you, Rebecca. Thank you, Mr. Baker. That was very insightful. Uh, we do have some questions from the audience. Okay. And I think I'll start with Aisha from Bangladesh. And her question is, what kind of responsibilities do you feel come with being come with being in your position and in your line of work? Well, I, I think I think we are we are very, very uh, uh, you know, responsible uh, very much. By the way, what, what do you see right now? Do you see anything? Uh, no, I can see you uh, full screen. OK, all right, thank you. Um, anyway, yeah. the um, the. Um, no, I think uh, we're all very, very responsible, and, you know, and then the game has changed. I mean, um, you know, the, this climatic issues were not nearly as uh, in the forefront, you know, a few decades ago as they are now, as we've, we've come to realize what, where we are. And so, um, uh, it, and, but it is this balance because, you know, uh, we have to, uh, uh, you know, there's all these people are going to, you know, we're going to have a lot more people. We're going to have a lot more people in urban areas, and, and and we need to have prosperity for these people. But we also have to address the climate issue, and so it's, uh, uh, you know, we have to both inspire people, uh, but can we do it with less carbon? Can we do it more efficiently? Can you know, and um, and so we have to be, you know. Um, very responsible and we should feel that as individuals if, if that I hopefully I guess I got somewhere close to answering that question. <laughs> uh, thank you. Uh, we have two questions that I think I might combine together. Uh, the first is how do you balance between sustainability and aesthetics? And the second is from Paloma who says, how do you think the balance between high tech buildings and a desire for contact with nature, such as parks and big green spaces, will work out. Uh, she says she's from Brazil and having moved from a small town to a big one, she really misses the abundance of nature. And is there a balance to that? Yeah, I, you know, the um, uh, a lot of time, you know, as I talking about the um, say the quote the perfect you know structure versus the aesthetics issues. Uh, generally, when you're when you're doing optimization, you're in a very low valley. With not much slope, so you have a lot of choices, and you may have a very, very small premium to have something which is actually. And aesthetics is important because you, you know you have to inspire people. You know we're shaped by our surroundings. If we're in, if we're in uninspired uh, surroundings, maybe we'll become in uninspired people. Um, and, and so you know, and we all need beauty in our life, and uh, and so the aesthetics is very important. And I think you can come with very beautiful things. Very elegant things, and there may be a slight premium, but not much. And, and I and I actually think it, it'll lead us to uh, new aesthetics. And now, now going back to to nature, yeah, this is a this is a big deal. Uh, biophilia is certainly one of the hot topics of today. Uh, getting plants inside the space you're in, plus around your building. In certain climates, in Brazil, you can, you're you're likely to be able to grow plants on the outside of your building. Can you use plants to shade your building from the sun? You know, so you're both doing. Um, you, you're you're doing environmental things, you know, and we need um, uh, our bodies uh, need the, the variety of, of bacteria and things that you know uh, that, that, that are out there to, to to make us resilient. And so, um, uh, you know, there is a tremendous amount of, uh, of movement. If you look at some of the architecture in the last ten years, go back just ten years, you'll see there's a lot more, shall we say, plants and making that part of part of the uh, the living experience. Now, having said that, it's got to make sense. Um, you know, there's certain certain climates; it's just not going to work. 
uh, the, other than plants on the inside, which we'll, we can always work. And, and, and there's a lot of people who are, who are developing um, new species of plants that can live on with less water and, and, and the like, or very lightweight soils. Uh, uh, even existing buildings, perhaps you can you can you can um, make them into green roofs using some of these very extremely lightweight soil systems, and so. Um, you know, it, which helps with ur urban heat island effects and the like, and so um, there, there's a, a lot to a lot to be done, uh, and um, and you know, and buildings should respond. To, they they should look somewhat local uh, in the sense they're responding to their local climate. Uh, you know that uh, um, where you are in the world makes a difference. Uh, right now, I happen to be, I'm normally in Chicago. Right now, I'm on. The, in Oregon on the coast, and it's, uh, you know, the architecture here is different, and it should be, <laughs> you know, because it's a different place. Yeah, thank you. That that was a question that I would have had as well, so it's good to have that answered. Uh, here's a question from Eros, who asks, how will machine learning or technology in general change the sense of responsibility or who is blamed in case the structure goes wrong? Ah. Uh. This is interesting. Um, you know, as a structural engineer, I still almost almost, almost medieval. I stamp the drawings. The, you know, I have a stamp. And now it's a lot of times electronic, but my signature is on that page, and, and I am personally liable. And it doesn't matter who made the mistake. If the computer program, or or or, or one of the people working for me made a mistake, I am responsible. And, and so, you know, that has to be part of it. And so you, you're going to have to do what you need to do to be sure that whatever that algorithm is doing uh, it, uh, makes sense. And a lot of that, uh, unfortunately, if I say, comes from experience. Uh, you, you learn to see what looks, you know, if something, you know, to me, if something doesn't look right, it may not be right. Okay. Uh, but early in my career, I may not have been able to, to, to spot that. And so maybe that'll be part of the another algorithm. We'll, we'll look at it and give it a smell test uh, and say, you know, you know, so, something doesn't look right. But having said this, you know, we, 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 these algorithms shouldn't lock us into what we've done in the past. Uh, you know, machine learning learns from what we've done in the past. I truly believe we can invent the new. Uh, the Burj Khalifa was, to me, a new species of animal, okay? Uh, it, it, was, it, was, it was something of a new scale. If you had taken like the Sears Tower or any what we call a point tower, which is basically a square or rectangular plan, and you make it twice as big, well, it'll be twice as wide and twice as thick, and we'll have eight times the volume. Whereas the Burj Khalifa, if I make it twice as tall, the wings will be twice as wide, long, but not as twice as wide. So it'll only be four times the area. And so, you know, it, it's a species that, that, that scales differently than, than the, the normal species. And th this applies to at all scales, not just going bigger, but, you know, as we go laterally in our, in our designs, we can create new things um, that are not, the AI may not find it because it, it's not in the past. Yeah, yeah, thank you. And Lawrence from, Sheffield, the University of Sheffield in the UK asks about your thoughts on the balance between building new and more efficient buildings and the renovation of old ones by installing better HVAC systems and insulation. And where do you think the balance between the two lies? Uh, yeah, uh, unfortunately, that's kind of like a case by case basis about whether or not to build new or re In fact, what we recently did a, a study uh, in, in Paris for a developer who's asking that very same question. And and uh, it, it's complicated, you know, because a lot of times um, um, the buildings maybe not be adaptable. And, 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 and so part of it is when you build the new one, uh, sometimes the most bespoke may make it not adaptable to the future. You know, uh, you know, sometimes we maybe make the ceiling a little bit higher or the columns a little bit further apart. So hopefully after the current users are done with it, someone else will actually want the building. And 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 so if you make the build, and one of my um, issues with some of the timber construction out there is that you end up with a warren of little rooms with load-bearing timber walls that you can never change the layout, and so you, you got to think about both that. And so it's, it's a case-by-case -case basis. It's much better to uh, reuse than than build new, if you can, and and can we extend uh, things higher? Uh, can we? 
can we uh, use lightweight materials like timber to make uh, the existing building taller to create more areas? And so, you know, this is all out there. So there we go. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and I think I think I could probably conclude with these last two questions that I'm again going to combine together. Uh, the first one is from Niranjan, who says, "How you manage? How do you manage academics and industry together?" And the second one is from Letty from Anglia, Anglia Ruskin University in the UK, who says, "Have you got any advice for recent graduates?" Uh, okay. Um. Yeah, we did recent graduates. Uh, do not take your first job based on the money. Okay, take your first job on where you're going to learn the most. Okay, because your whole philosophy will be set by, and your and kind of your say, say your professional personality will likely be set by your your first job. So, so so pick out the the, the first job where you're going to learn the most. Uh, and uh, academia, um, you just have to make the effort. Um, uh, I for my entire career, I've been uh, working in practice but also in academia um, you know volunteer your time um, for 12 years I, I I taught down at IIT and I got paid zero money okay I got some free lunches so that was about it okay uh, but, but I but I learned so much uh, you know if you want to if you want to learn something try to teach it good luck okay because you, then you really got to know it but also you 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 can collaborate with these researchers and the like and help them direct because you're if you're in practice you're going to know some very fundamental things that, that the that the academics don't know and that the academics are going to know things that you don't know and so it's a huge huge opportunity and so you just have to make the effort and um, you know give up a weekend here and there uh, or, or an evening and, and and do it okay so uh, with that, I guess we're about out of time here. It's, 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 it's okay. All right. Well, well uh, Rebecca, thank you for inviting me, and uh, I hope I hope uh, people enjoyed the uh, the presentation and discussion. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah, I think that was very insightful, and I think the presentation was a great roadmap for all the future engineers who were listening. And yeah, with that, I just want to say to the audience. Thank you for being such a wonderful audience and you can either now head on over to the next session which is also a civil engineering panel or you can head on over to the networking area a wonder.me link and i put both the links in the chat so yeah thank you so much once again to mr baker and to the audience for being here today and have a great day <laughs>